Good evening, everyone. I welcome you back to the valedictory come award ceremony of the International Research Conference 2022. Commencing this session, I would like to invite Dr. Rekha, Dr. Uh, Balram Tyagi, Professor Vikas Rai Bhatnagar, and Dr. Anuj Varma to kindly come up on the dais. Thank you, everyone. I request the best uh, paper awardees to kindly raise their hands virtually when their names are called. Starting off, I request Professor Vikas Rai Bhatnagar and Dr. Anuj Varma to kindly uh, give the award for the best reviewer. The best reviewer award goes to Dr. Neha Bhatnagar and Dr. Sheila Bhargava. Thank you, sir. I request Professor Vikas Rai Bhatnagar and Professor Rekha Gupta to kindly present the award for the best paper. The best paper award for the category SDG 3 Good Health and Wellbeing goes to Harold Andrew Patrick, Deepak Rangreji, and Jacqueline Kareem for their research on emotional intelligence effect on work-life balance among information technology employees. The best paper award in the category of SDG4 Quality Education goes to Komal Bhardwaj and Dr. Preeti Malhotra from GD Goenka University for their research on a study on how various dimensions of workforce, diver workforce diversity influence the various dimensions of employee engagement among teaching faculty of higher educational institutes. Thank you, ma'am. I request Prof Professor Vikas Rai Bhatnagar and Professor Balram Tyagi to kindly present the award for the best paper. The best paper award in the category of SDG 8, Decent Work and Economic Growth, goes to uh, Vidhi Mago and Dr. Yamini Gupt from Department of Finance and Business Economics, University of Delhi, for their research on effect of urbanization on poverty and inequality in urban India. The best paper award in the category of SDG 12, Responsible Consumption and Production, goes to Afreen Sultana and Mohammed Ismail Hussain, from University of Dhaka and SWOT consultancy and IT firm Bangladesh for the research on ethical purchasing gap, factors impeding university students in Bangladesh from ethical consumption.
Thank you, sir. Moving ahead with the valedictory session, I would like to welcome our distinguished guest, Dr. Olivier Ratley, a senior lecturer in organization studies at the University of West England, Faculty of Business and Law. Dr. Ratley teaches change management and research philosophies, methodologies and methods, and his lifelong work is concerned with how to encourage and protect pluralism in management and organization studies. He has produced important contributions to the study of academic labor and of early career academics in the contemporary business school, published in highly esteemed journals, including Ephemera, Organization Studies, and Management Learning. I now request Dr. Ratley to kindly address the audience. Hello, I hope you can hear me now. I think um, I was um, muted, so thank you very much. Um, so I will simply, um, I do have uh, some slides to share with you. So if you give me just a second, I will, um, I will make sure you can see them. And hopefully this will be, this will work. So it will just take a second. So hopefully you can you can you can see both um, the slides and and myself. Yes, sir, we can. Fantastic, fantastic. Okay, I'm sorry. Is, I, I'm, I'm, I just want to make sure everything. Okay, so I think it works. Uh, Amazing. Hello and thanks for uh, being here, everyone. I would like to thank first and foremost Professor Vikas Rai uh, Badnaga. Dr. Ratley, we are yes? not able to see your slides. Okay, okay. Yes, My sir. apologies. Let me let me have a look again at this. Okay. Are you able to see them now? Yes, sir, we can. Yes. I, OK, fantastic. Thank you so much for letting me know. So I was saying I, I, I would like first to, to, to thank Professor uh, Basnaga, who really kindly invited me to give this talk. And I truly hope that some of you will find it useful. Now, the conference has a, a theme on sustainability. So I chose to talk about something that makes academia unsustainable. It's an issue that affects us all, whether we are early career academics, I will refer to them as ECAs in my talk, uh, but also those who are at different stages of their career. And that issue is the fact that we are all so busy. We're busy all the time. And it's, it's almost boring now when you ask a colleague, how are you? And they respond, I am busy. Now, social theorists have talked about the compression of time, the acceleration of time, the complexification of time. And I would like to share with you uh, some insights derived from my engagement with the sociology of time. Um, I would like to suggest that understanding this complexification of time is important because it makes a difference for academics between merely surviving in their job or generally thriving and um, developing uh, themselves. Before going further, I want to acknowledge that what I will present is based on collective work. I've been working for 10 years with Alexandra Bristow and Sarah Robinson, and together we've made many contributions to the study of ECAs. And this talk is based on our 2019 piece, which I have highlighted in yellow. Now, 
In 2012, um, we set out to study the predicament of um, early career academics, mostly because at a personal level, we were all taken aback by the discrepancy between our expectations of what it would be like to be an academic and the reality of employment. We wanted to understand, among other things, why is academia often such an unhealthy place and what effect it has on ECAs. We were also disappointed to see that the literature portrayed ECAs as the passive recipients of wider forces on which they have very little control. And we wanted to understand how do people manage to make a positive difference in their uh, workplace. Now, um, our 2019 piece was inspired by this landmark book called Rhythms of Academic Life, which, funnily enough, does not really talk about rhythms. In fact, we read the whole book and found this quote. We only found this quote, which seems to be true to the title, um, to the title of the book. Um, here we have scholar Miriam Erez, who reports how her career followed a very different patterns uh, to colleagues simply because she gave birth to a child and how this difference in trajectory was not acknowledged. And we think that it's useful to think of this using the notion of, um, of rhythm. So we used ideas from the philosopher Henri Lefebvre and the sociologist Eviatar Zerubavel, who's pictured on this slide. And if time allowed, I would go more deeply into their work. But instead, I would invite you simply to think about how rhythm is important to music. We only really notice it if things go wrong, if the drummer skip a beat and think about what would happen if different rhythms were put aside, the, the result would be mostly, uh, most likely to be a cacophony. So we wanted to, to, to take on the idea that rhythm plays an important role in the ordering of our lives. It's what make it possible for people to predict and organize their activities. And we took from Zerubbabel this idea that modern Western society is characterized by a rigidification of time, which results in very pervasive forms of temporal regularities. For example, we have certain ideas and norms about the length of different career stages. Now, our contribution has been to develop the idea of academic arrhythmia. Arrhythmia is a word that you may have heard in a medical context. An arrhythmic heart is a heart that has lost its capacity to beat with regularity and to function properly. We wanted to use this notion in a sociological sense to describe the crippling effects produced by disruption in uh, life rhythms. So we ask ourselves, those three questions. First, we ask, how is the overall rhythmic configuration of academic life changing for ECAs and with what consequences? Then we ask, how healthy are the contemporary rhythms of academic life and how do, I mean, the answer you can imagine will be not very healthy. And how do ECAs cope with the resulting arrhythmia? And thirdly, we ask ourselves, how do rhythms and arrhythmia shape academic identity construction? So um, we found that the literature gave us some clues, though not necessarily cast in those terms. Uh, Tom Kinney, for example, talks about a temporal rigidification of academia by closing down the spatial and temporal autonomy long associated with the university life world. Others talk about a culture of speed and the fastening of the pace in academic lives. 
and increasing academic workloads. People also talk of a growing polyrhythmia, complexity where some rhythms are forcefully prioritized um, over others. Now, I'll say something very, very briefly about the, the method we use. Um, is simply we interviewed 32 early career academics in 15 different countries. Um, and we, we basically ask them to identify the rhythms that punctuate their daily life and, and how those clash. And we compare those accounts with various accounts that we found um, in, the, in the literature. Now, this is what we found, and I will explain all these things. On the one hand, we found some continuities between our interviewees' accounts and older accounts of academic work. When academics describe what they do, to a large extent, they still do the same things that they were doing 20 years ago. They teach, they research, they do some admin, they engage with society and <coughs> excuse me, research and teaching remain the mainstay of the profession. So what has changed then? We argue that five things have changed and I will go through each of them. First, uh, the relative importance of the different activities have changed. And that has implication for how people organize their life. Most of you will know what I mean if I say a day of teaching feels very different to the body than a day of research or a day of administration. If one activity becomes more important, it's also a way of organizing your life that becomes more important. Um, the second thing we observed is a temporal rigidification. Here we have someone, uh, they're all pseudonyms, but we will call him Oliver, um, who described how a temporal deadline was used very strictly to exclude someone from employment. He says, I had a colleague whose probationary target was to submit certain thing. Um, he said, it's all in hand. But they said, no, sorry, you didn't hit the target and therefore we're terminating your contract in a month. So that's a, a, a very good example of temporal rigidification. Third, we, we observe a, a fastening and intensification of the pace. Here, someone that we will call Freya talks about how her workload is managed with assumptions that are entirely unrealistic. And of course, the casualty of this is the quality of the work produced that isn't very good. She says the workload model in her institution is laughable. You get half an hour to prepare a new lecture for the first time and 15 minutes to prepare something you've already done. It just smells factory style education. Lecturers were creating slides from the instruction pack, cut and paste. I would lose the will to live sat in that lecture. Indeed, indeed. The fourth thing we saw is an encroachment of what was previously senior rhythms into the early career stages. Megan's here tell us about the unrealistic expectations she faces in regards to funding. Seeking funding used to be something almost unheard of for ECAs. It was something that was expected mostly of senior staff. And here Megan is saying, I don't really need funding, so why am I being asked to, to, to get some? Um, finally, we witness a proliferation of dissonant rhythm. The story told by Lucy here is something we heard from many colleagues outside the English-speaking world. She says, I do have to do research in English, but all the other activities to do, for example, and go engaging with various stakeholders in society, I have to do it in, in my country's language, in this case, French. But this sort of story was told by so many different people in different countries outside of the English speaking world. So it's, it's, it's as if you need to have two entirely different careers in different language. Now, the notion of arrhythmia become really useful to think about 
the situations where rhythms are clashing and where those clashes become pervasive and are also very zealously enforced. Here we have another quote from Freya, which is almost absurd. Freya is saying, if you didn't go to mandatory training, you got fined 50 pounds. Um, I generally couldn't go because every time they were running the course, it was clashing with my, my teaching. I am an empowered professional. I can make that judgment. So, of course, we have something that is entirely um, absurd there. So hopefully this notion of arrhythmia is becoming a little bit more clear. And I would like now to talk about how people cope with this phenomenon of arrhythmia. And we identified five strategies and I will go again through each of them. The first strategy consists basically in not doing anything about it, but as a conscious strategy. So people often think that they simply need to survive the early career stage and that things will be, um, will be easier after. But we think that this creates a particular kind of academic, what we would call a, an academic survivor. I have a very uh, poignant quote here from Raphael, who says, one of our interviewees, who says, people say there are two types of workers. You have the camels and the horses. The camel, when they run out of food, they go slower. They stop gradually until you understand that they are slowing because of a problem. People say that horses are different. If you ask a horse to go, the horse just goes until the horse dies. And now in academia, we are following the horse model. So um, quite a bleak outlook on um, academia. A second strategy for coping uh, with arrhythmia is to abandon certain activities in order to minimize clashes between the different activities. So, for example, we have here Sophie who said, I did have a bad habit of volunteering for things, but um, I've had to stop doing this. She said there was this administrative role. I thought I would like to do it. I could do it. I would be good at it, but I can't do it along with everything. So Sophie is abandoning certain activities in order to minimize those clashes between uh, the rhythms that structure her life. We got a third strategy, which, which is to try to find ways to make conflicting rhythms more aligned or more eurythmic. For example, by creating more obvious synergies between different activities. Um, it's, 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 it's common to try to think, for example, of uh, your research agenda in relation to your teaching uh, duties. A fourth strategy is to establish um, a chosen rhythm and a chosen pace and really to stick to it without being influenced too much by what's happening around. And I'll give you here a quote from someone we will call Harriet, who said, if I had published more, I could be a senior lecturer by now, but I decided that I would take things at my pace. Thank you very much. So Harriet is, is saying, Whatever the expectations are, she chose to basically um, to basically ignore them and do her own thing. And finally, there's a fifth strategy we've observed uh, a lot is that some people choose to uh, to stop playing the game, to leave their institution for another one in the hope of uh, finding a better workplace or sometimes they, they, they choose to leave academia altogether, which of course is, is a loss and is um, a, great, a great shame. I've got two quotes that are quite interesting to look at. One from Anaya who says, I think one major effect is feeling somewhat paralyzed, not being able to move. You're a bit in a zombie-like state where you hate where you are, but you're feeling unable to go anywhere. The way the institution can make you feel worthless is quite sublime. And someone even more desperate, Rose, who said, I told my husband, 
if we could find a job anywhere outside this country, I'm going. Even if I have to fry potatoes or make hot dogs, I'm going. So, so, uh, and that person ended up leaving, uh, indeed, academia. So I'm going to slowly, slowly head toward a, a conclusion, but I, I want to mention the way we theorized this whole problem. We talk about a vicious circle, the vicious circle of arrhythmia. And what this denotes is the fact that many of the strategies that people use to deal with arrhythmia end up normalizing it and even creating more of it. So for early career academics to genuinely thrive, we have to think about how to break up this vicious circle, which is not very easy. Um, most of the ECAs I talk to they have this general feeling of inadequacy, of not performing well in their job. But there are systematic problems that make academia resemble some sort of gladiatorial contest instead of being the apprenticeship it should be. It's important that ECAs tell themselves that this is not their fault. It may not solve the problems, but at least it will make them feel better. And that is something. I have witnessed many colleagues, sometimes far more talented than me, being driven to leave academia uh, because of toxic or unbearable work conditions. And to me, that is a real uh, tragedy. It's a real shame. So how do we start tackling those problems? It's clear to us that when people find solutions to the problems I discussed today, those individual strategies have limited effect and, in fact, they can be counterproductive. Collective strategies are really needed here, and in that sense, there's an important role to be played by by unions and by more senior academics toward supporting their junior colleagues. Since, um, since we published this study, I've been reading a number of self-help self books on getting organized, managing your time and things like that. And one that I found particularly good is by uh, the author Carl Newport. It's called A World Without Email. And Newport aims to address one important problem of our time, the incessant flow of emails that any knowledge worker has to deal with on a daily basis. And he's very clear that while individuals can do things to improve how they manage their day, ultimately those strategies have very limited potential. He proposes instead that organizations as a whole need to make conscious decisions about how to organize their workflow away from email. And I think that there's a parallel here in the sense that academia is characterized by many inefficiencies and many absurdities, and there's often very little incentives to address those. ECAs are either managed um, or, or, or they are left to themselves rather than being proactively supported. So I think we need to move from individual to collective solutions. And this brings me to my second point, the lack of proactive and genuine support, which I've generally observed. It's quite typical when an employee struggle with the demands made on them to send them onto some sort of workshop on time management or how to deal with email or whatever. And of course, there may be a good intention here, we have to recognize that, but it's generally profoundly ineffective as it does nothing to address the root issues that are causing these problems. Many of the top-down forms of support are nothing else than disciplinary mechanism to al align the employee with the strategic goal of the organization. And if we really want to support ECAs, well, it will sound simple, but then we really need to want to support ECAs. 
in my view, many measures that fail to support ECAs, um, they are simply characterized by a lack of sincerity. I could relate to my own experience by saying that I've often been offered some, some sort of help, but I've never really been asked, what help would you actually need and how can we make it happen? Finally, and that is the specific point of this talk and the particular um, outlook we bring into this discussion, universities need to appreciate how rhythms organize our lives, how they are pervasive, how they structure everything, and how insightful this notion can be to think about creating a healthy work context. Rhythms can be too fast, they can be too complex, and like melodies and harmonies, they need careful handling. Without that, we risk entering a state of arrhythmia that doesn't do great music and that doesn't do great workplaces either. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for imparting your knowledge to our audience filled with academic researchers from across the globe who would have related to and learned from your assessment of the rhythm of an early academic career. To express our gratitude to you, sir, we would like to present a hand-woven shawl sourced from Khadi Gram Udyog. The concept of Khadi was developed by Mahatma Gandhiji to provide employment to the unemployed rural population during India's struggle for independence. And I would like to invite Professor Bhatnagar and Dr. Anuj Varma to present our token of appreciation. Thank you. I'm very much grateful for this. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now the key note speaker for the conference, Dr. Ashok Hosla, is a sustainability pioneer committed to creating eco-solutions for people and the planet and is the chairperson of the Development Alternatives Group. He is a PhD in experimental physics from the Harvard University and is an alumnus of the Cambridge University as well. He has held various na national and international positions such as the Director of the Office of Environment, Government of India, and director in Um, I, is, is my screen visible? Yes, sir, it is. Uh, because I can't see it on here. Okay. Um, the, um, I'm trying to move it and I'm not getting, getting it, um, just one second. Now it's disappeared. Um, okay. 
So, uh, you know, one of the important lessons that we learned from those who came before us is um, that we, we need to open our minds to, to all the things that the world has to offer. And as our um, Prime Minister, Lal uh, Bahadur Shastriji said, you know, the limitations really live only in our own minds. If we use our imagination, the possibilities are unlimited. And frankly, uh, I'd like to say that that is the deepest insight that is of use to a student or to a professional in life. You know, India has made incredible progress over the last 70 odd years. We've uh, grown into a nation that has in it some three, four hundred million people, the size of the population of Europe, which lives in the style and lifestyle of uh, the population of Europe. Uh, we've done an enormous job on removing large numbers of people out of poverty, and some of the consequences of these are very important for us to recognize. We have beautiful possessions, we have great shopping opportunities, we can live very well, but our, life, but our world really uh, is in trouble. And one might well ask, is it really sustainable? Uh, the earth is in crisis, in fact, it's growing crises, there's pollution, there's population growth, there is extreme uh, debilitating poverty uh, afflicting a very large part of the global population. Uh, loss of biodiversity and extinction of species at a rate that hasn't been seen literally hundreds of millions of years. Uh, we have climate crises, uh, with changes in uh, climate patterns that are already becoming uh, debilitating for the global economy. Uh, so social breakdown, and violence, uh, and enormous amount of alienation, which is leading to terrorism. Even financial systems, uh, which are some of our big, major contributions, have a tendency to break down more and more frequently. And so we have a world in which we've got enormous riches and wealth, and at the same time we've got urban chaos and pollution in our waters and air, our countryside is poisoned with chemicals and substances that are no good for either the growth of food or for people. And then there is about half the population in the world that is actually living in a subsistence society. So from the half that has overconsumption, we have another half which is got enormously under-consuming of resources. This leads to povertitis, and povertitis is a, a terrible disease not just for the people involved, but for the rest of the world. I, every time I see this picture, which is which I took some years ago in an area of central India where, where I work. Uh, and I'm reminded that here, in, a, in, a, in this picture, are all the belongings, you might even say the whole world of this woman with her children, and, and what enormous loss to the nation uh, of, of young people who could have grown up to be scientists, to be musicians, to be teachers, um, none of these uh, children here will have ever a chance to contribute to nation building. Uh, these are women, about 300 million people in our country have uh, no, no clean drinking water, and they spend a good part of the day collecting fuel wood and water and carrying it home. And basically, they're all trapped in a cycle, a vicious cycle of poverty. How do we now figure out a word which is going around, everybody talks about the circular economy, which is a desirable thing, but the circular economy is only good if it's a virtuous circle. And taking a vicious cycle of this kind, making it a virtuous cycle, is going to take a lot of effort. So here we have a world which is split between three, three and a half billion people who are over-consuming and roughly the same number of people who are grossly under-consuming. Take uh, India. Let's take India. India is a place which has two countries in one place in time. There's the paradox of privilege and plenty. These 400 million people I was talking about who live more or less the same way as middle class people all over the world. And then there's about 800 odd, 900 million people who got left behind in poverty and pollution. And at the same time, we've got climate change threatening our lives, our forest fires, our droughts. A very large number of people live, for example, in places which are too dry to grow food. This is a picture of an area also in 
the central part of India, Bundelkhand, where the uh, forests have just been completely denuded. Uh, our de deserts in, in our country are growing, according to Un United Nations, at something like 10,000 square kilometers per year. Our species are disappearing. Here is a species called the rosy periwinkle. It's a flower which grows now only in a few hectares in, in Madagascar, but basically it's the only known source of cure for childhood leukemia. And you know, once it disappears, uh, it's going to be very hard to find a substitute. Uh, here is our national animal, the tiger, uh, gone from 100,000 at the beginning of the 19th century, uh, I'm sorry, the beginning of the 20th century to something of the order of 2000 uh, today. And here is a tuna, one tuna fish, which was sold for a million dollars in Tokyo a couple of years ago, three years ago. And um, you can see that if anybody ever sees a tuna in the high seas, a uh, bluefin tuna, they are going to uh, make sure that they get it because it's worth a lot. But by doing so, they will have exterminated one of the mightiest creatures uh, in, in our uh, biology. Uh, we have uh, our resources are massac being massacred. Uh, sand, one of the most um, common materials, uh, is now so scarce that it's become a, a, an illegal substance being handled by a mafia, which is a 400 crore, uh, 4,000 million rupee business per year. So we are in fairly serious trouble uh, with peaking of many things not just sand, but food production, topsoil, phosphorus, without which food cannot be produced, fish, fisheries, according to the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations, uh, about 60 to 70 percent of the fisheries of the world are now in a state of, um, of total destruction. Water supplies, uranium, rare earths, you name it, uh, we're running out. Uh, we're not really running out, but they're becoming more and more expensive to get because we've taken all the low-hanging fruit. And that ends up in giving us a problem with the kind of impact that human beings are having on the ecosystems, which is essentially growing now to a stage where we already need two planet Earths to sustain the current consumption patterns. And as you know, that's not very feasible. If you have a bank account and you have a lot of money in the beginning, you can keep on drawing out more than you put in. But at some point, uh, Mother Nature's bounty will have been exhausted. This is a rather dramatic uh, um, chart which shows you the state of affairs on equity, on how the di disparities in our country, in India, uh, exist. These are government statistics, and the blue line is the number of millionaires in thousands. So um, over the last uh, 40, 50 years, uh, you can see a, an ex enormous ex exponential growth of the number of people who own a million U.S. dollars or more, uh, and it's something of the order of half a million people already in India. On the other hand, if you look at the red line, that is the number of undernourished and hungry people in the millions. That means something of the order of 200 million people in our country are uh, undernourished. It's very strange that one uh, lot of people can keep making more and more money while the others basically stagnate and can't move forward. So we have two diseases, affluenza, too much, poverty, too little, povertitis, too little. And these, these are diseases that actually feed on each other. Povertitis leads to despair and alienation and violence. This little girl has a, certainly has a right to ask, you know, what has my country done for me? And her two little brothers, the one in her lap and the other one, are really asking, you know, what sort of a future do we have? And, you know, I see that picture as an indictment of everybody in this audience, including myself and our establishment, which for 70 years has not been able to offer her a better life. So there you are, you have COVID that comes along because uh, we are so vulnerable that, uh, you know, infections abound. Everybody around the world has the same problem, rich and poor. 
Um, but we've got to recognize that COVID-19 didn't break the system. It, it simply exposed how badly broken the system was. And uh, this le leads to uh, eco-refugees and all kinds of other problems that go with it. Uh, this map of under-consumers shows that more than 50% of the people on this planet uh, could benefit from a better use of resources, better, better access to resources. And, um, and with that, they would be uh, inclined to get their lives into shape, have a little more hope for the future. And with that hope, almost invariably, almost 100% correlation uh, comes smaller families, lower population growth, and solving some of the other problems that uh, our, our planet faces. So tomorrow, whether it's from uh, diseases, whether it's from breakdown of uh, the economy, whether it's from hunger and poverty, whether it's from civil strife, uh, we, we, we just have to look um, to Ukraine today and see, you know, people are now traveling. They don't need passports or visas. They, they've got a right to have a life. And they're refugees from development projects, from uh, dams, from, from uh, roads, from making new cities, refugees from so-called natural disasters, refugees from ecosystem destruction. And in due course, in the next few decades, more and more refugees from rising sea levels. So the 195-odd heads of state and heads of government got together in 2015, recognizing that we're in trouble, uh, and uh, endorsed uh, these 17 SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, and we are in the middle of a 15-year period uh, when we're supposed to be implementing them. I'm afraid we're uh, nowhere near on track, but um, it is extremely important that all of us, including our educational and research institutions, find ways to help uh, get back on track. Otherwise, all of us will pay the costs. In business, the kinds of people that um, you, the, the, your, your institute of management uh, trains um, these goals are translated into a, a, um, an acronym ESG, uh, which really is no more than saying that uh, the planet is important, that society, the people are important, and our systems of decision-making are important. And so, you know, you will see more and more of this coming up. Business people love to talk about these things. They go to cocktail parties and talk about their commitment to ESG. But their actions don't always show that. And, uh, and, and the purpose of my talk to you is really to look at how we get them to do that. We are in the middle of a very lopsided model of development. It's based basically on neoclassical economics, which has uh, very major flaws. Uh, for neoclassical economists, GDP is king. Growth, growth of the economy is what it what to do that is more foreign direct investment, higher stock market indexes, growth rates are, uh, are pushed up, rising foreign portfolios, hit and run on resources. Uh, basically, the question of resilience is not even considered in, the, in, the, in that economic uh, subject. Uh, and, and, you know, they basically ask, what did the future do for us? Why should we uh, leave behind a better future for next the future generations. Uh, according to neoclassical economics, nature doesn't count. It has no uh, monetization value for them. And therefore, you know, why, why, why bother about human happiness and human well-being? Uh, they've got nothing to do with, uh, with money. And uh, if the community suffers uh, through uh, all the problems of violence and alienation, that's too bad. It, in fact, leads to more growth because you need more policemen and you've got to pay policemen and before it becomes part of your growth economy. And the neo neoclassical economics leads to neoliberal policies, and these neoliberal policies are all about giving incentives to business, the ease of doing business, higher efficiency, less regulation, 
getting into global markets, reducing costs by uh, increasing austerity for the poor, et cetera, et cetera. It's all about raising consumption and producing more and more things. We live in a, in a world that is really changing very fast, and it's changing, in my opinion, for the worse, because it's becoming fit only for the very rich. This is an island in the Caribbean, and the only people who think that they will survive while the rest of us drown are the billionaires who own these islands. You know, this is a diagram, uh, this champagne glass diagram, we call it, which was on the cover of the first human development report of UNDP in 1991. And it showed that 85% of the world's income goes to the top 20%. The old Pareto rule. 80% of the top, 20% uh, uh, of the top get 80% of the in income, 80% of the bottom get 20% of the income. And in fact, it's a lot worse than that because uh, you can see it's a pretty narrow uh, stem of the, of the champagne glass. But this was in 1991, which is about 30 years ago. Literally 15 years later, 15 years later, the world's GDP had already gone even more askew. By year 2007, the champagne glass had turned into a bar stool. We don't talk about 20 and 80 anymore. We talk about 90 and 90 and, and, and 10. And in fact, most of the time, it's people uh, like Mr. Piketty who talk about 99% and 1%. And today, you know, it's really coming down to the 0.1%. 0.1% owns half, more than half the wealth of the world. So this overconsumption that is caused by affluenza and underconsumption caused by poverty are both destroying our world, our societies, our civilization, and in due course, our species. Extreme disparity, injustice, unfairness are the symptoms, the manifestations of our, uh, today's political economy, the neoliberal economy. So it's not very dissimilar from colonialism, except that it's colonialism within, the, within each country. And so let me come back to Bharat. Bharat is where I think all of us ought to be focusing our attention. When, uh, you know, campus interviews take place and all our institutions are proud of saying that our people, our student graduates, are getting such incredible packages of lakhs and crores, frankly, it's missing the point. Their lives and lives of their children are going to be dirt if they're not able to see the impact of that kind of thinking. Solutions lie in sustainable lives and livelihoods. And... We've got to have an economy that is for people, for nature, and for prosperity. So the social, the people, must have their share. The economic and efficiency issues must have their share. And it's only at the intersection of these three where you get a sustainable future, where people have decent lives and they have fulfilling and healthy futures in each case. So there are three dimensions, the people dimension, the planet dimension, and the prosperity dimension. So we now need people like you and me to define the goals. What is efficiency and what is sufficiency? Of course we need efficiency. We don't want to use our resources up faster than we need to, and efficiency is incredibly important. But so is sufficiency. And sufficiency has two meanings. The sufficiency that Gandhian sufficiency is to have uh, no more than you need. Sufficiency at the ceiling means that there is a, there's a ceiling about, about which you do not have to go. The efficiency at the other end, on the floor, is that everyone should have a decent amount to live on in terms of food, shelter, clothing, education, health care, uh, decent livelihoods, decent lives. So we've got to now turn our economy around, and the only way that's going to be done is the young people graduating from, from our, our institutions uh, today and uh, tomorrow. Um, 
the give and take behavior of our people in our leaders' terms. You know, um, the previous speaker was talking about arrhythmia. The biggest arrhythmia in many countries, including ours, is corruption. And um, I'm, I'm proud of this logo because I designed it and I asked uh, the National Institute of Design to, to um, actualize it. And, and it basically says, Lena Dena. You don't give, don't take. And basically, I think this should be on everybody's t shirt for the next few decades till we stop messing around with the future of our country. The social concepts that are fundamental to that future are equity, social justice, fairness, inclusion, participation in the decisions that affect our lives, transparency, and they all must come together to eradicate poverty. So we must now go from a linear economy to a circular economy. Our job now is basically to uh, design systems, production systems, consumption systems, etc where we stop taking from Mother Nature, using and then throwing away to a revolving use of our resources in such a way that the wastes of one industry become the raw materials of another. It's like uh, mining our urban wastes. It's like industrial ecology. It's like uh, using our resources in our cities and our settlements in ways that uh, basically uh, are uh, circular, uh, using different kinds of technologies, for example, lighter than aircraft, which are one hundredth the cost of rail transport. Uh, I, I think these are things that we now need to start looking at, and that's why innovation is so important. Existing technologies are uh, for industries that are based on physics and chemistry. They are hugely resource guzzling, particularly fossil fuels, and also materials, and they regurgitate huge quantities of waste. Plastics, an incredible, incredible uh, innovation and product of human, human science uh, uh, um, endeavors, uh, is transformed the lives of everyone, whether the poor or the rich. Without plastics, it's hard to imagine having a decent life at home. But it's also destroying the planet. We get buried in plastic waste in ways that are totally destructive. In fact, the oceans and the living resources in the oceans are paying a huge cost for all the same plastics. The future industries are going to have to be based on disruptive technologies that reduce waste and, and uh, produce, use more secondary materials. Um, and one must ask, for whom? And I really want to make a plea that the most important people for whom technology innovation is needed are the people who got left behind, ones that need to improve their lives the most. And these are need of what we might call frugal technologies. They're not substandard technologies. They're affordable technologies that make life much better. And I'll just give you very quick examples of a few. This is the headquarters of my own organization, Development Alternatives. Uh, our, over the last 40 years, we developed huge quantities of new kinds of technologies, and some of them are in the area of construction. And this building has been built by, with, with our own technologies using compressed earth blocks, virtually no cement, no steel, no bricks, no wood in it. Very, very little, just for structural strength in various places, but that's it. Uh, it uses compressed fly ash blocks from uh, waste materials from thermal power stations, demolition waste, stone dust from mine, mines, and there's less than 30% virgin material in it. And you can see it's a reasonably uh, elegant and, and functional building. We've been offered huge amounts of rental money for space in it uh, because it is a good building. But its impact on Mother Earth is about 60% less than a normal conventional building. So our organization has uh, three broad thematic focuses, uh, how to improve the incomes of poor people, how to maintain a clean and green environment, and how to empower people and their communities. And over the last 40 years, we've done a lot. This is, you cannot read this, but 
this shows the kinds of additional uh, innovations that we keep working and delivering every year. And these include some quite amazing stuff. LC3 is a new cement, the fifth cement in history. The first four were Babylonian cement, Roman cement, Pozzolanic cement, and Portland cement. And this is the fifth one. And it produces 40% less carbon dioxide into the atmosphere uh, than uh, any previous cement. Uh, this is a vertical shock ripkin. These are various other kinds of technologies, all of which can completely transform the lives of people in villages uh, in ways that um, conventional business has not been able to do. These are check dams. These are water harvesting structures. Uh, probably the highest return on investment in any development technology. These um, dams have a return on investment of anywhere between 200 and 600 percent per year. Uh, the amount of money we spend on the one in the top right hand was approximately 5 lakh rupees. And the amount of money that accrues to the farmers around it, to the women who, who pump water from the wells and so on, uh, the additional earnings are at least six, seven times that, that initial investment every year. Livelihoods. Handmade recycled paper, uh, you're using solar energy, various kinds of use of local materials like these weeds to convert them into uh, electric power uh, at a commercially viable rate, um, new kinds of industries, and then reporting on all this, reporting the environmental, social, and um, uh, economic uh, returns, if you like, uh, for all these, this work. Our organization is very careful about its report cards. Uh, this is the economic report card, how much income was generated because of our work in a particular year, et cetera. Uh, this is the report card on the empowerment of communities, uh, how many people were reached, how many people uh, got, uh, you know, licenses or Russian cards or were able to get jobs or whatever, how many women particularly were made able to read and write, become, illit become literate, and the environmental uh, report card. How many new ways of saving uh, resources, water, soils, land, etc. So I from organizations to develop new kinds of technologies for, say, new materials. There's unbelievable uh, potential for new businesses based on environmentally sound and appropriate technologies, uh, biochemistry based technologies. Uh, I think the biggest future um, you know, what we uh, technologies based on lessons from nature, biology. Uh, the five kingdoms of nature that can be used to convert deserts and savannas into tropical rainforests, which we've done and very successfully in a commercially viable way. These are termite hills, uh, termite, uh, uh, and because the termite, in order to protect the queen termite, has to build this tower in such a way that the internal temperature inside it uh, remains at around 26 degrees centigrade all through the year, whether it's freezing outside or it's boiling outside. And that's done by designing the flow of air inside it. So without any air conditioning, they are able basically to uh, do something which this architect, the Swedish architect who made this building in the capital city of Zimbabwe, Harare, uh, used this technology. Uh, and this building is completely without Extra, uh, mechanical air conditioning. It is air conditioned by the systems of the termites. This, uh, again, the zebra, zebra, zebra's stripes are actually an air conditioning device. You can see those moths cooling themselves uh, in the airflow around the zebra. And uh, buildings have been built using those. This is the scientist who developed the first heart pacemaker, cardiac uh, rhythm. We've been talking about rhythms. Uh, Jorge Reynolds, 
uh, was the inventor of the um, pacemaker. And later on, by studying the heart of a whale, which, by the way, is so huge that it's the size of a small Maruti Swift, uh, the heart of a whale taught him ways in which to develop a new cardiac rhythm pacemaker, which doesn't need batteries because it uses the heat of the body to power it and, um, and can also give radiate signals, which can go straight into your uh, smartphone. Uh, these are other kinds of things from nature. For example, ball bearings made with the uh, lessons from this uh, lizard in the, in the Sahara Desert, uh, which can go at speeds of 30 kilometers an hour under the sand. Uh, repel bacteria without antibiotics uh, by using the methods that kelp, that seaweed uses. So there are all kinds of ways in which uh, we can do this. This beetle at the top right is amazing because it, well, it's in one of the driest deserts in the world, in the Namibian desert in southwest Africa, and it can draw from the air enough water to, su to support itself and other creatures. And the, the scientists in Oxford University learned from that and designed the fabric which does that and is now being used for that purpose. So there are many, many ways in which we can do these things. I'll give you some examples just to show you that the future of humankind is replete with hope and, and good, good things, provided we do those things that are good for everyone. So I don't want to keep you any longer. All I want to say is that the biggest te disruptive technologies will, of course, be the ones based on knowledge. The ones in the digital revolution, things like blockchain and uh, virtual 3D uh, printing, uh, logistics, biotechnology, virtual and augmented reality, blockchains, of course, and artificial intelligence. We need to harness these, not just for India, but for Bharat. And I hope that all of you will see ways in which to do that, because this girl is ultimately what India is about. If her life doesn't improve, yours and mine can't either. So thank you for your patience. Thank you, sir, for addressing the global challenges like poverty, health, inequality, COVID, and more with a focus on India, and how sustainable lives and livelihoods of the younger generations building a circular economy and suitable alternatives to our resources might turn the tide. I would like to invite now Professor Balram Tyagi and Professor Rekha Gupta to present a memento of our appreciation, which is a hand-woven khadi shawl to uh, Dr. Khosla. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm sorry I can't be there with you, but I appreciate your gesture. I now request Dr. Anuj Verma to present the vote of thanks. <coughs> Hello. Good evening, all of you. I think vote of thanks is the most important, one of the most important event of any event. And I'm being honored to deliver that. That means I'm one of the most important part of this IRC. Thank you. So uh, let me uh, thank the speakers on behalf of Lal Bhavi Shastri Institute of Management, our chairman, our director, and the convener of the IRC, uh, to Dr. Uh, Oliver Ratley and Dr. Ashok Khosla for uh, delivering the uh, valedictory uh, uh, speech and uh, enlightening our students about uh, the two 
major aspects. One obviously is slightly more concerned about the academicians, which uh, we are all struggling today uh, in the pace of that. And the other one was the enlightening. It was uh, very, very enlightening for all of us. Uh, long back, I met my charter accountant and I asked him that I have a problem of income tax. So he said, you are lucky that you don't have an income problem. You have just have an income tax problem. So I am shocked that the people of the country and the world so are struggling with a lot of poverty issues. And I think uh, sustainability is one of the major goal and uh, issue which we need to address upon. And I think this IRC conference is one step in that uh, way. As we have done this conference on a, a digital mode, so we have, I think, saved a lot of carbon uh, emissions. Uh, on the other hand, I would also like to thank the organizing committee before, because without them, this uh, event won't have been possible. Uh, especially few of them have especially told me that we have to take, I have to take their names. Uh, Kushbu ma'am, and uh, Smita ma'am, Rashmi ma'am, Ishmita ma'am, uh, Dashna ma'am. So they are, they, I, it is not that I am telling their name because they have told me but it is actually the hard work I have seen in the last three months they have gone through, and especially our uh, convener, uh, Dr. Vikas Rai Bhatnagar, he has put in tremendous hard work in organizing this event. Uh, obviously, the direction of, for this event and all the events in the Institute are shown by our beloved chairman, uh, Shri Anil Shastriji, as well as our director, Dr. Praveen Gupta. So I would like to thank both of them for uh, being the torchbearer. I would also like to thank uh, the admin team for putting up this, uh, all the admin support to our IRC team so that this kind of event could take place. So I, once again, I thank uh, Dr. Oliver Ratley and uh, Dr. Ashok Khosla for being there uh, in spite of all the odds, because I just came, came to know that uh, both of them have some medical issues and they were struggling with that, and still they uh, made it and delivered the wonderful speeches. So thank you, sir, for this wonderful military speech. And thank you all the audience for being there and making this event a success. Thank you, all of you. Good day. Have a good night. Thanks. Bye. Thank you, sir. It was an extremely enriching experience today where we saw deliberations from speakers across the globe share their research and views on an agenda that is our future. As a youth, I would like to say that a healthy life and the world is our tomorrow, if only we start today. I would like to conclude this conference by quoting Paul McCartney. There must be a better way to make the things we want, a way that doesn't spoil the sky or the rain or the land. Thank you. <laughs>